The purpose of this series is to take a deeper dive than we traditionally do in our interpretation regarding privateers, tall ships, and the Chesapeake Bay. This series will introduce you to often untold stories of survivors, African Americans, Native Americans, women, and others. In a moment, I will introduce tonight's guest speaker, but before I do, I wanna take a few moments to do some housekeeping and give you a peek at what's to come in the weeks ahead. The platform that we're using this evening is Zoom Webinar. For the purpose of tonight's presentation, you will only see our speaker, Tom Waldron, myself as the MC, Patrick Smith, our program coordinator who will be running the PowerPoint and feeding the Q&A, and Captain Yao Miles, who will be available during the Q&A. There are more than 100 people signed up for this tonight, which is amazing. We're so excited, but you can imagine if we actually had everyone's picture showing and had the chat box open, it would be chaos. So we encourage you to please put your questions and thoughts in the Q&A, which you can find at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your question, keep in mind you can always contact us at pride2, the number two, at pride2.org. I want to quickly highlight the speakers that we have lined up so far for the coming weeks. Next week on February 10th, Michael Kent, author of Mulatto, The Black History of Calvert County, will be speaking about the choices enslaved Blacks had to make because of the 1814 British invasion of Southern Maryland. On February 24th, Tim Grove, author of Star Spangled, The Story of a Flag, a Battle, and the American Anthem. Mr. Grove has authored numerous other books as well, and in fact, will be releasing a new book this spring, so stay tuned for that. On March 3rd, Kate Marks from the National Park Service will speak about the Star Spangled Banner National Historic Trail, and she will be joined by trail ambassadors from throughout the Bay with a focus on telling the stories of women along the trail. Special note, and we planned it this way, March 3rd is not only the anniversary of Fort McHenry becoming part of the National Park Service, but it's also the anniversary of the Star Spangled Banner becoming our national anthem. Pretty cool. Uh, last but not least, on March 10th, Jeffrey Bolster, author of Black Jacks, African-American Seamen and the Age of Sail will be our guest. You can see why we're so excited about this and we hope you, that you are too. Remember to register for each lecture. Links can be found on our website at www.pride2, again, the number two, dot org. Sim simply click on come aboard while you're there on our website. After you register for the various lectures, check out our online gift shop where you'll find really cool t-shirts and shot glasses and some really new coasters that we now have available. Speaking of shopping, if you don't already have a copy of Pride of the Sea by Tom Waldron, you can purchase a copy on Amazon. If you use the link that was shared in the announcement for this evening's lecture, Pride will receive a small commission for your purchase. Also keep in mind, you can support Pride by when you shop on Amazon by always shopping through Amazon Smile and setting Pride Inc. as your chosen charity. So now for what we've all been waiting for. We're excited to kick off our series with Tom Waldron, author of Pride of the Sea. I have to tell a personal story that on my first day at Pride, which was exactly three years ago today, of all things, I couldn't believe it when I thought about it, uh, the staff actually had placed Tom's book on my desk. And they said, the very first thing that you have to do is read this book. Well, I took that to heart. And of all things, you know how it happens when you start a new job. You either catch a cold or you have jury duty. I had jury duty within my first three weeks. And so I took Tom's book with me and I read it. I luckily, I didn't have uh, any, um, I wasn't caught into a jury. So I read the book during the entire day. I got almost done. I had just a little bit to go and got home and finished it that night. And as you can imagine, the stories of these real people, it was just, it was so emotional for me and it really highlighted for me the importance of the role that I was going to play as the director of this amazing organization. So with that being said, again, put your questions in the Q&A. We'll get to those at the end. I'm gonna turn it over to Tom. And Tom, we're so thankful for your, you being here and doing this for us tonight. So welcome. <laughs> I'm frozen. <laughs> uh -oh. Thank you, okay. Here, Jeff. Thanks so much. Thanks to the Pride team. And um, I just want to have a special thank
know what's going on with the internet. Okay. You're coming in. Um, anyway, thank, thank you so much, Jeff. Let me just dive right in. Um, and I want to say a special thanks to Miles, the captain, who um, obviously, or really, um, maybe I'll turn my video off, see if that helps for a minute. Just keep me posted on how it sounds. Um, how, how's this? Uh, can you hear me? Okay, Jeff. Okay, let's 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 go to Islands on 1986. All right, everyone hang tight. I think Tom's trying to sign back on. <clears throat> I'm back and I apologize. Um, next slide, please, Patrick. Um, hey, Jeff, can we take a two minute tech break, I will reset my internet. Yeah, totally fine. So everyone, we're taking a short break and Tom's gonna to reset yeah, his internet. And we'll be, be back and rocking and rolling. Meanwhile, not to put Patrick on the spot, I bet he has some cool pictures he can show us. <laughs> Oh, um, Patrick actually just sent me a message and said, uh, if anyone has some questions for Captain Miles, um, please send a couple in now. And that'll be a good way to spend a minute or two. Please put your questions in the Q&A and Patrick will feed those to us. Captain Miles, um, Martha Waldron says, what has been your favorite port of call? <laughs> wow, there have been a whole host of wonderful ones, but the, uh, the one that we return to whenever we can is Baltimore, Ireland. Uh, the hospitality that uh, was the very first experience sailing the old pride of Baltimore over to uh, Europe in 1985 was a, um, a landmark experience uh, and uh, the uh, and we've made such friends at that time that in every subsequent voyage of the second Pride of Baltimore over to Europe we've always uh, paid a visit to Baltimore Ireland that's um, a one uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the hospitality there the friendships made there um, lingered and and uh, so, yeah, that would be the favorite port to visit. Uh, so, uh, but there are plenty of wonderful places that Pride has been both scheduled and unscheduled as we, we sometimes make a uh, pull into a vessel, a port uh, in, in between major stops. And those can be wonderful experiences. We actually have two people, Captain Miles asking the same question. What does the schedule look like for 2022? So uh, we'll, uh, be active in the Bay in partnership with a number of local partners um, from um, late March through May. Uh, at the beginning of June, another partner um, uh, uh, institution of uh, well-known uh, organization in, in Maryland, the Eastport Yacht Club, uh, the organizers of the Annapolis to Bermuda race every two years, this is one of those years. So. They've asked us to help highlight their um, enterprise. So we'll be sailing with the fleet over to Bermuda. And then from there, we're into the Great Lakes. The uh, national organization, Paul Ships America, coordinates every third year, and this is the, 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 the year for it, uh, with ports in the Great Lakes, both Canadian and American, to uh, 
um, to host, to organize, and then have a fleet of vessels be the Tall Ship Festival group. So we have a number of uh, ports to visit in uh, Lake Erie, um, Lake Huron, and Lake Superior. Uh, we'll return to uh, Maryland uh, in um, late September and get busy again here in home waters as well as the whole length of the bay, what would the uh, great Chesapeake Bay schooner race, which is a, uh, a uh, uh, more than 30 years annually um, celebration of the bay, both Virginia and Maryland celebration of the bay, support of the bay. So uh, 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 an active season. And we have another question. Are there any items from the original Pride that are on Pride 2? Uh, I think we have a bit of art in the sense of a old sextant that was never used by Pride because it was even older, more like a, uh, a octant. Um, the, uh, uh, everything that was with the ship when it went down went with the ship. But because of coming back from Europe after being there in about a year, um, there were a number of things that were offloaded to Pride and put on a container and the shipping container came over to uh, home. On, there were a number of things on there. So um, I lost track with the possibility that we have uh, um, anything physical to the ship itself like sailing gear, because of course that would be on the ship. Um, but I do have this impression that we had a, an, a, some kind of an heirloom that came across and, and because it, it was kept, as, uh, it was the other captain, Armin Assessor chose to uh, organize the ship for a long transit home. And so a number of things were sent back. Thanks captain and Tom, it looks like you're back. You know, the, the Zoom age has taught us all a lot of patience and a lot of skills. So I'm, I'm back and I apologize and we'll knock wood that we'll be okay. Thank you, um, you're all good. I'll just dive right in. So as I was saying, um, the Pride was the city's uh, goodwill vessel. And um, you know, what a beautiful piece of goodwill she really was. Um, it's funny, the only, time, the, for, the only time I really went on Pride was uh, way back in the eighties, obviously. And uh, there was a, that was being hosted there. and. Artie Donovan, the Colt, was there. I remember Artie coming on board with his beer. Um, but that was the uh, first time. The next time I interacted with Pride was in May 96. That's, of course, when we lost Pride at Baltimore at sea. Um, Pride was lost um, in the Bermuda Triangle in the Sargasso Sea, headed back to Baltimore from the Caribbean. Um, next slide, please. Um, you, you can imagine um, the... Uh, the outpouring of what a tragic day it was when we learned about the loss of pride. Um, was the sailors came home and um, Captain Miles, very young Captain Miles there, I believe, um, was there at a press conference. The whole city was in mourning. I was a reporter at the Baltimore Evening Sun, which doesn't exist anymore, sadly, but I helped tell the story um, about what had happened to pride. Um, a few years passed and I got to know a man named Eamon McGeady, who was a very uh, big part of the Pride organization uh, here in Baltimore. And of all places, we were sharing some time together when the Pope came to Baltimore at the cathedral, I was covering it and Eamon was there to see it. And we started talking about the Pride of Baltimore. And, um, you know, he said to me, um, next slide, please, Patrick. He said to me, you know, um, Captain El Cesar went down with the ship. And we just started talking about that. I said, what, what do you mean? He says, yeah, it's, um, yeah, he, he was, um, he, he chose to go down with the ship. I thought, well, that's pretty amazing. Um, I said, is that possible? And you know, I, I, I begin to think about that and I thought about the story of the pride and I realized it's a very compelling, sad, tragic, but interesting story. And, and the, the idea of a captain perhaps doing something as dramatic as that was pretty, pretty important for me to figure out. So I started working on the book, um, researching the story. Um, I interviewed six of the eight survivors um, at length uh, two were reluctant to take part in those interviews. I talked to relatives of the other people on board Pride, uh, former sailors, the city officials, lawyers, others. I went to Washington State, Minnesota, Maine, New Jersey, and a lot of places around Baltimore. I read all the coverage in the media, and there was quite a lot around the world about the loss of Pride. Um, I also talked to the people who investigated um, the uh, Pride 
DeLoss, the Coast Guard and the National Transportation Safety Board. And um, I dug into a lot of documents that had not really been looked at, I don't think very closely about how the vessel was built and how it was insured, among other things. So next slide, please. So what did, what did I learn? Um, well, I came to learn talking to people about Pride that she was fast and fun to sail. She was also a little scary in, the, in, in certain circumstances and sometimes not that trustworthy according to some of the sailors I talked to. And she was wet a lot of the time. Um, I'd like to read you an excerpt, um, the first of a couple I'd, I'd like to read tonight about, about the Pride and what it was like to sail on her. When, when the wind was right, the pride heeled gracefully and glided powerfully along under a vast expanse of dirty white sails. It was unforgettable sailing, like riding bareback at night on a wild black mare, one crew member liked to say. The pride and her sailors developed an intimate relationship with the sea, which was just under them. In even moderate conditions, water washed down the weathered pine decking. When forced to sail close to the wind, the pride crashed through the waves the best she could, the sturdy jib boom leading away off the bow, plunging again and again through the sea. It was a dramatic sight, the heavy piece of lumber extended 40 feet ahead of the ship, laden with lines and heavy furl sails, went under, straining at the sea, and after a breathtaking moment, sprang free in a foamy geyser. A crew member caught out on the jib boom in such conditions had two options, climb up out of the way and watch, or hang on to the boom, get dunked one or two times and take the ride of a lifetime. Next slide, please. So just going back in time a bit, how did Pride get started? Um, this fella is Melbourne Smith, who I think more than anybody had the vision for Pride in a way and, and, built, and built Pride. Um, think back to the 1970s in Baltimore, the, the harbor was decaying, falling apart. Um, there was no inner harbor. Um, city leaders took action, things started to change. Charles Center was built, um, which kind of signaled a new commercial um, center in, in the city. And there was this, you know, empty or more or less empty uh, harbor and the powers that be in Baltimore said, let's put a ship out there. What, let's, let's find a historic ship to call and display to celebrate our history. Um, the obvious choice was a Baltimore Clipper, the fast ships that were made in Baltimore that drove the British crazy in the War of 1812. Privateers took uh, bigger British ships because they were faster. They could sail close to the wind because of their sail pattern, unlike bigger, boxier British ships. But the problem was there were no more Baltimore Clippers. They were just gone. Um, so the only, the only answer then was to build one. And so that brought in Melbourne Smith, who was um, a really fascinating guy, an artist, a shipbuilder, a dreamer, and a bit of a showman. And one thing about Melbourne, he also knew the risk of a ship like Pride. Um, and he, he characterized it pretty vividly. I want to read you one excerpt from Jeff Melbourne. He wrote this about, about the, the kind of boat he was building. The vessel must be considered extremely dangerous if allowed to be sailed with incompetent crew. The very nature of the design would not meet with Coast Guard approval for commercial use and passengers would not be permitted while underway. Smith added, it is of course these features that make the type exciting. So um, Melbourne knew what he was building and um, the idea was to build um, a ship that would stay in the inner harbor as a tourist attraction or as educational tool, maybe sail around you know, the bay, um, and, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a section. Slide five, please. Uh, next slide. Um, so some of the workers that were brought in to build a Pride came from Central America. They were experienced woodworkers from down, down that way. Um, some did great, one cut off his finger, some drank too much, but the ship was built slowly but surely. Um, one thing I discovered as I did my research, the ship was built, um, but some concessions were made. I discovered uh, the builders used 10 times less ballast than the architect had called for, which was a, a purely a decision based on just budgetary issues at the time. Um, next slide, please. It was 1976 as Pride was being built. Remember that was the bicentennial year and 
people flocked to the city to see tall ships that came to the harbor. It was a, a, a breathtaking display of beautiful sailboats um, in the harbor as Pride was being built. Um, and it kind of got people here thinking, let's do more with our, 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 our wonderful new ship. Let's sail the ship um, because it could be a goodwill vessel and take the, take the message outside of Baltimore. Um, the decision was made to name her the Pride of Baltimore, um, which was a bit of an allusion to one of the uh, most famous privateers from 1812. Um, the, the Chasseur was the, the name of the ship and it became known as the Pride of Baltimore. That was its unofficial nickname. Um, and was quite uh, famous for wreaking havoc during the war. Next slide, please. Um, 1977, Pride was finished and the Pride sailed out of the Inner Harbor. That's Melbourne with his um, jaunty hat waving at the crowd. <laughs> you know, wonderful ceremonial send off. They only made it as far as St. Michael's. Um, they had to, had to stop, the, the, rope, the rope rigging was wobbling. They re-rigged the entire ship with cable enclosed with artificial rope. It was, um, you know, the idea was to build it as, as uh, historically, authentically as possible, but lessons were learned rather quickly that some, some of the old techniques just weren't necessarily where they needed to be to, to sail a boat as, as big as pride. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, Pride became a beloved symbol of Baltimore. It stayed in the harbor uh, sometimes, but it also began sailing and going further afield, um, up and down the coast, down to the Caribbean. Um, she really became one of the most famous and revered tall ships in the nation. Uh, next slide. And um, she was uh, had had some issues. I'll, I'll say that over over time, there were things happened to Pride that were a little nerve. Racking, I would say um, so, some were made known to the public, others less so. Uh, in one case in Florida, the bowsprit cracked in heavy seas, which threatened the rig, which would have been a you know, catastrophic loss, but it, it, it didn't come to pass. Another time, Pride was sailing around uh, Cape Hatteras, and a, a, a sort of unpredictable weather pattern blew the boat out to sea, and the ship ran out of food. Um, apparently, except for mustard and a few other things. Um, it was pretty hair-raising. This is before some of the communications tools that we have now, and people thought Pride might be lost at sea, just really didn't know. Uh, finally, uh, she limped home, and next slide, please. And she um, had, uh, next slide too, Patrick, please. She was towed home into Delaware Bay by the Coast Guard, um, rather ignominious into that trip. Um, that was a news photography, uh, news photograph taken at the time. Next slide, please. But those are moments of despair. There are moments of pure beauty too. This is Pride on the West Coast, um, sailed through the Panama Canal, went through Acapulco and on up the West Coast. This picture was taken in San Francisco, racing another schooner. Um, and, um, you know, had just made, made headlines wherever she went. And just a beautiful, beautiful um, goodwill ship for us. At the time though, the, I think the Pride organization got, I would say bored is the wrong word, but expanded its ambitions for, for Pride. Um, for several years, Pride had done mo more or less the same kind of trips around the Americas. So in 1985, the organization decided to take the ship to Europe for two years, which would be her first ocean crossing. Um, I looked carefully at that decision and there were a lot of interesting things I found. Um, the insurance companies that insured Pride were, were not um, happy about that. Some balked. In the end, they did get insurance, but the premium skyrocketed and the deductibles were increased as well because there were questions about whether Pride was suitable to go across the ocean. There were also questions about how to sail Pride across the ocean. Some people suggested take the top rig down. That's the top sails because it, it makes the boat top heavier. There's also a question about what to do with all the fuel one would need for this trip across the ocean. But in the end, the decision was made to keep the top rig up and um, put all the fuel on deck or, or some of the fuel on deck to, um, to make the trip. So next slide, please. So off she went to Europe. Um, this is a, a photograph taken by Captain Miles, I believe on the way to Europe in 1985. Um, one of the first stops in Europe, uh, next slide please, was 
in Ireland, in a place called Baltimore, Baltimore, Ireland, um, where the locals treated the crew like heroes. Pat, next, next slide, please. Um, that's that's our, our crew in, in, in Ireland. You see pride in the background there. That was an unofficial stop just for to have some fun and, and meet the locals, I believe. Pride um, made its way to London and then Scandinavia, and then a planned trip to Poland. Uh, interesting time as communism was starting to, to come to an end in, in Poland and elsewhere in that, in that part of the world. As um, the ship crossed the Baltic uh, to head towards Poland, um, a terrible moment happened and Armand Elsasser, the captain um, I mentioned, was at the helm. Uh, uh, weather kind of overwhelmed the boat and two sailors went overboard. Uh, you know, terribly in the middle of a you know bad weather situation, terrifying. The ship had to come about in heavy seas and lost track of the most uh, inexperienced crew member, the cook, who had gotten washed off the boat. Uh, finally, they, they found her and rescued her and all as well. You know, I discovered some letters that Armin wrote and he was shaken. He, he wrote to his girlfriend at the time who was on the pride with him. And it was a rather hair-raising uh, letter he wrote about Pride, and I want to read you a, the last paragraph about it. So Armin wrote, while I look forward to getting to Spain, I'm just not crazy about returning to Pride. I feel little of the confidence and trust in her you feel for Westward, which was another schooner, and for good reason. The crew will be just fine, but frankly, the experiences last summer have left me feeling very uneasy. They recur to haunt me. The prospect of losing a life fills me with the most horrible dread and that awful moment surfaces to remind me of just how close I came. So next slide, please. Um, after that, that mishap in the Baltic, the, tri the trip continued and the pride made goodwill stops in other parts of Europe and ended up in Malaga, Spain, where this picture was taken. Malaga is the hometown of Picasso and a busy port city. The plan was to get ready for the rest of the European tour and uh, the second year of the tour. Um, at that point, Captain El Sastre rejoined the Pride um, in, in, in Spain. Several new deckhands from Baltimore flew over um, to take Pride through Italy and Greece, You know, very exciting itinerary through the Mediterranean. But this was 1985, recall, and that was a terrible year for uh, terrorism in Europe. You know, Rome, Vienna had horrible shootings in the airports, as I recall. The Achille Loro, the, the cruise ship was um, taken over. And the Pride organization decided they needed to get the boat home and cancel the tours. It was deemed to be too dangerous for such a visible American target to be sailing through Europe. Um, so the decision was to bring the boat home. Next slide, please. So I think quickly the, the, the the Pride organization and the captains decided on an itinerary to bring the, the boat back across the Atlantic to the Caribbean and bring, bring her home to Baltimore and ultimately find some sailing to do you know, in, in the States for the rest of the year. Um, this picture is taken by the Gibraltar as Pride was sailing out. Um, the crew um, headed out and caught, and caught the traditional Atlantic crossing and the trade winds heading west. Uh, one of the first stops was Madeira. Next slide, please, Patrick. Um, these are some of the crew <laughs> on their time off, and I might be having a drink or two, I'm not sure, um, but in Madeira, having fun. These were, you know, bear in mind, these are young people on board for the most part in their, in their 20s, um, you know, maybe close to 30. Um, next slide, please. These pictures kind of give you a, a sense of what it's like to sail, what it's like to sail on Pride. This is the crew. Um, having a meal, you know, just having fun, you know, young, very young people. Uh, next slide, please. This is Joe McGady, who was um, on the ship. Uh, Pride sailed on towards the Caribbean. There was great winds for sailing, easy sailing as the crew got to know the ship. They didn't have to do all that much. They just set the sails and just kind of kind of went across. Um, but there were a lot of tasks, you know, maintaining a wooden ship required, you know, constant work and repair and just a, a tintiness. Um, these are fairly Spartan conditions, very tight quarters for sleeping and for living and eating. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned, they were young. Armin, the captain was 42, by far the oldest. 
But, you know, I, I talked to some of these guys and, you know, they had no bank accounts. They lived from, you know, port to port and just, um, you know, couldn't have been happier with the lifestyle. Next slide, please. This is um, a picture kind of messed up on the side, but a picture of a haircut on board. Um, you know, great camaraderie that was built on, on board the ship as the 12 people sailed pride home. Each time they crossed a, a time zone, they had a happy hour. Uh, flying fish would, you know, jump on, on the boat as the ship sailed and the cats would grab the fish. And um, there's a lovely passage about sailing on pride in this trip that I wanted to um, the quote and it was written by Captain Elsasser. Captain Elsasser was a really quite a good writer and kept a beautiful captain's log. And some of the excerpts in the book are from that log. He wrote, glorious, glorious sailing. Now we are flying and we come off the foamy white crests of sapphire seas. Pride lifts her head four to five feet above the waterline. The jaboon points skyward and our ship rushes ahead throwing spray and foam then settles back to the deep with a thunderous roar, the power, the energy, the giddy feeling of soaring through liquid blue space. Um, I just love that excerpt. I think that really is a beautiful way to describe powerful sailing. Next slide, please. So Pride made it to the Caribbean, uh, no problem whatsoever. Um, this is a picture of a Sugar Flanagan the first mate um, climbing out to do some something with the sails. They really didn't have much of an itinerary. They were in the Caribbean. They kind of uh, did some sailing. They took a lot of pictures. They were teaching some of the newer crew members just the ins and outs of sailing pride um, and prepping for a trip back up to Baltimore across the ocean. Um, there was a, a romance kindled among two of the crew in the Virgin Islands. And um, thankfully, one of the things that uh, Armin and his crew did before they sailed home was to send home a package of logs, photos, video, and other materials documenting the trip. So that's why we have these wonderful images of, of this uh, phase of the trip. Next slide, please. This is one of the last, I believe Armin took this picture. And this is one of the last pictures taken of Pride. Um, Pride left the uh, St. John in the Virgin Islands. Um, in May, a couple of days later, on May 14th, if she was sailing north towards the, the Chesapeake Bay, uh, the wind picked up. Armin was um, watching the weather carefully. He dropped some sails to you know, prepare for windy conditions. The wind picked up and it was an unexpected squall. And next thing you know, there were 70 knot winds. That's what's been estimated. We're, we're, we're churning a, the boat. Um, as captain, he had two choices in that, in that situation, really, to run or turn in, into the wind. Um, Armin tried to run with the wind, but the ship was knocked over by the wind, just went st straight over on his side. It was chaos, as you can imagine. Um, the crew it jumps or falls into the ocean. All the stuff on board is falling into the water. The ship is starting to sink. Um, you know, the crew had to steer clear of the rig and, and get away from a sinking ship because it creates a suction that would suck anybody down with it that was too near it. So people are running and swimming away from the ship as best they can. Uh, two life rafts were on board and those both popped free of the pride as they were supposed to, but neither inflated correctly. So amid the chaos, the beautiful pride of Baltimore fills with water and as it does, it, its hull turns and the ship is again pointing upward as it slowly sinks. The last thing to go under are the mast and flags. So imagine you're, you're on the crew and all of a sudden the ship is gone. It, it's only a matter of minutes really. And so instinct kicks in and you say, well, there's life rafts, let's get to the life rafts. And most of the crew did make it to the life rafts even though they were not inflated, they, they were able to hold onto them to some extent. Off in the distance, some of the crew saw Arma and the captain swimming away from the rafts. It was not clear why. Next slide, please. This is um, a model of, this is the life raft, I believe. Um, and you can see it wasn't very big. There were eight people were clinging to a blob of disinflated rubber, basically, and a few supplies. Eventually, they were able to inflate one of the life rafts by hand, by mouth. 
The other one had been punctured and could not be um, saved. So eight of them pile in this little raft. It's about the size of a single bed mattress, if you could picture that, with a tight sloping roof. Um, there's no way for anyone to be comfortable. There's a bit of water and a bit of food, a couple of flashlights and flares. They are miserable and they have lost four of their crewmates, including Armin. Next slide, please. Of the 12, four were missing. This is Vinny Lazaro, who's the engineer. Next slide. This is Barry Duckworth, who was a carpenter on the ship. Next slide. And Nina Schack, who was from Baltimore, a very small, petite woman. She and Vinny had started a romance in the Virgin Islands. And there's some speculation or some surmise that he was trying to save her and they both died. So they're in the raft um, for four and a half days. Things are getting bad. Uh, one of the crew members is starting to have some, oh, I don't know, uh, going delirious from dehydration. Um, but they, you know, they, they, they managed to kind of keep their sanity in general, but they were running out of supplies and hope. Um, they did have a flashlight though, and, and one night they spotted a Norwegian old lady when the crew members got on board and was chosen to call Baltimore first he called his mom and said mom the pride sank um, just a quick word my internet is unstable I'm gonna turn my video off let's see if we can get through um, it was heartbreaking news the city was in shock um, this next slide please Patrick the um, survivors flew home to Martin State Airport in, in Baltimore County. Um, that's Gail Shaw, who's executive director with Sugar Flanagan, the first mate, and Captain Miles. Um, they told their story. The city was reeling with grief about this. Um, soon enough, of course, two major investigations started by the Coast Guard and the NTSB. I looked carefully at those investigations. I talked to some people involved in those. and. You know, in the end, um, the conclusion of both of those investigations was that nobody in particular was actually really responsible. It was essentially an act of God. That's what was determined by the investigation. Um, you know, it's hard to argue with that conclusion, but there were many decisions along the way that affected Pride's ability to withstand such a storm and raise questions about why it was in the open seas. Um, you'll, you'll have to read the book for all those details, I'm afraid, though. Um, so next slide, please. Let, let's move forward. And um, a, a few months after the sinking, Sugar, Flanagan, the first mate, and Leslie McNeese, the, the bosun who had been partners, um, got married. They had agreed to, while they were in the water, literally as pride was sinking, if they survived, they would get married. And they did. A, a few months later, they invited the rest of the crew to join them. This picture of the eight survivors of the pride of Baltimore was the last time the eight were together, I believe. And interestingly, at least three of these crew members got back on ships that same summer and started sailing professionally right again. Um, and Sugar and Leslie lived on their own schooner full time for many years and may still for all I know, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, sailors through and through wanted to get back on the horse as it were. Um, next slide, please. Um, after Pride sank, there was an outpouring of uh, support uh, and anguish. People started raising money. Literally, kids were collecting money on street corners in Baltimore. There were radio pills, a telethon, and the decision was made by uh, the powers that be to build a... second Pride of Baltimore. This time Pride was built with um, Pride too. Of course, it sailed many, many countries through Asia, of course, all over, all over North America many, many times. And is an amazing goodwill symbol and um, carries a beautiful message about Baltimore. 
So one more slide. Um, so I go back to what started my conversation and that was um, what happened to Armin? Um, did he go down with the ship? Some say, yeah. See, others say no way, especially the ones who were on board the ship with him don't believe that that's what happened. But let me just read how I kind of summarized it at the end. Um, maybe what happened. This is me kind of speculating based on everything I know. Picture the moment when the pride began to sink, riding itself as it dropped, its mass spars and pennants disappearing into the ocean. For nine months, Armand had lived with the memories of the near disaster in the Baltic. Now suddenly the ship was gone and his 11 sailors were fighting for their lives. Such a catastrophe could crush any captain's spirit, but at the same time, make him desperate to make amends. Half an ocean away, Jennifer, his girlfriend, knew intuitively that Armand could not have survived such a blow. He would not have given up without trying to account for every sailor and every last supply. We can surely imagine the captain of the lost pride slicing over the waves, his heart racing, a dreadful sense of failure, ta failure tearing at his soul. His eyes scanned a churning sea for something, anything that might begin to redeem the loss. Whatever he sees over the waves, whether real or imagined, surely is worth trying to reach. And with that, I will say thank you again for having me. Um, really, really enjoy telling the story um, over and over again. I apologize for the tech issues. Thank you so much, Tom. And I think part of it is the weather that we're having. For those that are local, it has been rain, rain, rain. Although I guess we're glad that it's not snow or a blizzard. Uh, Tom, I'm just so thankful that you wrote the book. Um, and it really was just such an experience for me to read it. Um, we do have a couple comments. Um, and if Captain Miles, if we can get you back on the screen, a few of these are directed um, to you. <clears throat> um, Captain Miles, uh, one of the attendees says, Jan, I recall a few of the board members telling me that one day Peter decided she was seaworthy and took her out. Not the official first sail to St. Michael's, but the first time she left port. Um, I'm, are we talking about the first vessel or the second vessel? I think they're talking about the first. Um, <clears throat> I don't know anything about that uh, at all. Um, my first engagement with the ship directly was in 1981. And uh, Peter Boudreau uh, was uh, part of the building crew of the first vessel. Um, he gained a great deal of admiration from Melbourne Smith. Um, and on the first ocean voyage, uh, Melbourne as captain, that voyage after they left St. Michael's and got in the rig sorted out, they voyaged to Bermuda. And that was in 1977. And Peter was second mate. And in Bermuda, he was promoted to first mate. Um, a, a Peter has a very solid background in the traditional skills that are uh, very applicable uh, to that type of vessel. Uh, proven even further by the fact that he's the formal builder of Pride of Baltimore II. Um, Peter remained first mate throughout that 1977 season. Um, and then um, um, when Melbourne moved on, the city uh, asked Peter Boudreau to be uh, continue on as captain of which he accepted. Um, and of all the captains that are part of this legacy, um, he became the second captain and he uh, was the youngest captain ever to be uh, part of the pride story. Hey, Captain Miles, there, there is a, there, I, I think the, the question asker is, might be recounting a story of the second boat. Uh, Peter Boudreau took it for a joyride in, in, in Baltimore Harbor. Is that? A, oh, a, well, there's a, the, first of all, the, 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 before the vessel was officially completed, there were a number of uh, operational trials um, by the builder under, under the uh, management of Pride Inc. Uh, Pride Inc. is the company that built the boat. Um, on behalf of the citizens of Maryland uh, with monies brought together, not only privately, but also by the state and by the city. So the, the second vessel was launched in April of 1988. Um, and the whole summer was spent 
finishing the vessel because when she was launched, she was launched without an accommodation, without any technical gear inside, no engines um, and no rigging. So uh, it took a, another six months more or less to finish that. And when they got to a sailing moment where they got most of the gear on board, they were doing some checking sailing. And so she was sailed uh, by the builders um, verifying that everything was operating the proper way. Uh, and there was a couple of times when, uh, uh, or one time when I was on board for a sale and we did a public relations sale with the press. And, um, and it was just in the, inner, uh, well, not the inner harbor, we went out to the Patapsco River, but it was uh, to the west of Key Bridge. And, um, and it was a way of checking things, testing things. Um, traditional rigged vessels, when they're brand new, they're rigging stretches under load. And so you need to tighten them up quite frequently until most of that stretches out. So you go tighten it up, you go sailing, you tighten it up again, go another sailing and that goes on. So anyway, uh, that might be what um, is being referred to. Uh, but there are numerous times the vessel got underway in Maryland, in Baltimore area, Northern Ma Chesapeake Bay before she was commissioned in October um, and uh, I was tasked with making the first maiden voyage uh, as an ambassador for Maryland and Baltimore. Oh, oh I think Patrick, I don't want to trip over Patrick. Were you about to talk? Well, so I was gonna, I was gonna field the next question for you. Um, so, so we've got a, a question came in. It's um, so everyone's been careful to avoid placing blame on anyone, any one person. Uh, but how are the designers of the original Pride taken on to build other record, other replica ships? So Gilmer for Pride Two with uh, Melbourne Smith with Niagara, were they reevaluated in their in the wake of the first boat sinking by? So I guess the question is, uh, do you think that the first boat sinking? caused Gilmer or Smith to reevaluate some of their ideas um, or, or do anything different? Is that, is that for me or for Tom? I think that's, for, that's a question for you, Cap. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the question of replica is what was being reviewed. Um, with the enthusiasm of replicas faithfully constructed being sailed, um, <clears throat> there came the question of, it was, was, uh, 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 was there a call to force authentic replication? Oh, shoot. Sorry about that. Okay, um, okay, sorry. So, um, so that philosophical, it became much more a philosophical conversation, for instance, yachting vessels that may not be replicas or even if they are replicas because they're used for recreation. There is no particular standard that has to be met. But <clears throat> as Tom pointed out earlier, the moment you start any kind of commerce and particularly with taking people who have paid you money to take them for a ride, then there's a whole host of standards. So the, the, um, the mission of, of, of the city looking for a Baltimore privateer was a replica, not about going anywhere much. And so there was a bit of what sometimes is referred to as mission creep with, with the fact that Tom Gilmer, excuse me, Melbourne Smith with Tom Gilmer, by the way, for clarity, there was a consortium that built, that was hired by the city to build the boat and it was, it was Melbourne Smith's consortium, of which there were two other key people, one of which was Tom Gilmer, a very accomplished naval architect and well known for his designs. And so um, it, the, the, the focus was on replication. So um, with the mission creep of going further afield, the modern sentiment about what is a durable vessel at sea uh, is, is, is going to be a question because there are different standards of acceptability. And as Tom pointed out in his story, uh, and I sailed that boat a, a lot. I was in the Pacific with the boat as well as in the Caribbean and the Great Lakes. So I took her to Europe. I sailed her in Europe uh, in 1985. And I found the vessel um, invigorating. Uh, I found her needing a, 
a, a strong hand. Um, and that, by the way, is anecdotally recorded back in the 1812 war period by both the British and the Americans with regards to these are not for anybody who's just an ordinary sailor. So um, uh, uh, the, uh, the question then goes to, well, was it worth it? Well, I would say that adventure is always going to raise that question if tragedy strikes. Now, one of the things that came out of that search for reason for that accident is the National Weather Service went to both the NTSB and the Coast Guard and said, we want to be a witness to the hearing. And the question was, is why do you want to get involved with this? It's because the testimony of the survivors is a perfect ground truthing example of what happens with a microburst. And of course, no one knew what a microburst was. So after the Pride Act hearing and the, con and the, and the description by the National Weather Service of what was going on by uh, reviewing satellite photographs and comparing um, other evidence with the testimony of the survivors, this turned into a full decade of educating the recreational marine and professional marine public with what a microburst is. So that's, that's something I would commend people to go to Wikipedia and look up the word microburst and get an impression. Um, when that accident happened to the boat, there was no visible means of knowing that a microburst was going to be there. They had 100% cloud cover, uh, no modern technology radar that was available to use. Today, Pride of Baltimore's got the two. We've got the radar. Uh, we've got an educated maritime public, both recreational and professional. So, um, when lightning strikes, you can't always be sure to be able to avoid damage, no matter how well you protect your house, your building, or your boat. Uh, if you do protect it, you reduce the problem or the risk of real damage, um, but you can't guarantee it. So. Uh, my, my com I commend everyone to go look up microbursts. It's a stunning bit of weather that is not uh, regular, but is but it's also not unknown and not uncommon. We have a question for Tom. Uh, Tom, what was the most memorable aspect of riding Pride of the Sea? You know, um, it, it, for me, as a I was a newspaper reporter, and you know, I, I love the moments where I just got to spend time listening to people. Um, I, I, the most, you know, and hearing the stories of their loved ones, you know, the, of their children or their, you know, their friends, um, and people were very generous about that. Um, I think the most amazing moment in my research was um, that letter I, I read. Um, that Armin wrote about uh, the loss in the Baltic Sea, the near loss that really shook him up, was given to me by his former girlfriend who, who still lives in Baltimore. And um, she thought hard about that and finally gave me the letters. They were very, very personal, intimate letters, but she wanted me to have the full story. And, and she gave me those and it was an act of generosity that I'm very grateful for. And in a way it made the book because I understood Armin's, what he was thinking about pride so, so well you know, as I, as I dove into the story. So that, that was the most interesting moment for me was getting those letters. I think this next question can be for Tom or for Jan. Um, the question is, was the first Pride originally to be a dockside attraction for the Inner Harbor? Yeah, I mean, Jan can weigh in too. I, I think the idea was originally, yes, that's that was pretty much the idea. Um, and then it gradually uh, expanded to let's sail around the bay or the harbor and then from there, basically any, anywhere. Um, yeah. Yeah, the uh, anecdotal story that I was introduced to was the um, middle of the construction in 1976 of the first boat. Baltimore was visited by a bunch of long, large, long square riggers from all over the world. And, 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 and the anecdote is because the vessel under pride under construction in the Inner Harbor, somewhat nearby the Maryland Science Center location, uh, was on display. And so sailors of those vessels from around the world, those tall ships that visited Baltimore were asking a question, is this going to be your ambassador? <laughs> so that sort of created a stimulus of conversation that helped, helped 
um, consolidate a decision because the original Pride plan was without an inboard engine that was to be a 100% replica. And halfway through construction, a decision was made and money was raised to put an engine and a propeller shaft and a propeller in the boat for the purposes of going outside of the state of Maryland. The next question is, do you feel microbursts are partially a reason for the Bermuda Triangle folklore? Oh, well, it could be, but let's understand that cumulonimbus is a cloud structure that we know as sometimes thundercloud, big vertical columns, a pillar that, that is seen in the distance, and they are very common in the tropics. So the business of a very tall columnar cloud, a cumulonimbus, going all the way up to above the altitude of airplanes going to 60, 70 feet. This energy that's going on is so great that when it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, and then hits the surface, it creates or it brings with it a great deal of energy. Um, so, uh, but going to the Bermuda Triangle, uh, we have a 3000 mile continent from the Pacific to the Atlantic that has a whole lot of weather going on that's drifting over to the Atlantic. Uh, and with that, there's different moisture, there's different temperature, um, uh, there's, and, and that is then going over the Gulf uh, Stream and going into um, on. And so the, 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 and the Gulf Stream itself is a current that's fantastic um, as a river in the, in the ocean. Um, the, uh, the underwater topography changes too. And so we have a uh, Northern Atlantic Gyre, all these things combined to be a lot of going on with a lot of traffic. You got all these folks going to the Caribbean and coming back to the Caribbean. You got, even back in the days of only sail, uh, when the Europeans came across in the 1600s, the Spaniards and the, and the, and the other Euro Norm, there was an increase of traffic that had not been going on. And they were discovering how, how the weather is very changeable. So I would say that, that, that with ever, ever increasing traffic, it's like a question of an intersection to have a stoplight. Is it adequate just to have a stop sign or do you need a stoplight? So uh, the, uh, there's a lot of traffic, airlines, uh, military flights, uh, recreational flights. It's a very busy triangle. And so uh, with a lot of weather that goes on and it's all vertical and three-dimensional as well as horizontal. So it doesn't surprise me that there's a lot of incidences that at first we would never hear about because there was no modern technology to track it. And then as we start to track it, we start to develop a lot of understanding. There's, there's stuff going on out here and things can go wrong. Well, I think we have um, the last question of the evening, which I can actually take. Um, the question is, how does the organization commemorate the anniversary of Pride's loss? Um, every year on May 14th, there's usually a very quiet um, laying of a wreath at the memorial that is in Rash Field. Um, this, this year, um, May 14th is actually on a Saturday. And if you have not been to the memorial before, I highly encourage you to go. Um, and this year with it being on a Saturday, um, stay tuned and, and we'll be able to share what the plans are for this year's uh, laying of the wreath. Um, Tom, I'd love to give you kind of the you know, any last words that you have. I'm just so thankful you were willing to do this with us tonight. And um, I hope you're not stressed out about the internet. It is the new world of dealing with all this stuff. So we're thankful for you. And um, what are your last words? <laughs> you know, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate the support that the Pride organization has given the book and um, the story. And, you know, I, it, it, we, lost, we lost four people that day, but, um, you know, you guys do a great job of keeping their memories alive. And, um, and I'm happy if my book helps do that a little bit too. Thank you. Absolutely. And I've given your book as a gift to quite a few people. <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone for attending tonight. We do want to thank once again, the Maryland Humanities Council that has made this series possible. If you tuned in late, um, a quick word that next Thursday on February 10th will be speaker Michael Kent author of Mulatto, The Black History of Calvert County. He'll be speaking about the choices enslaved Blacks had to make because of the 1814 British invasion of Southern Maryland. Um, if you have friends that were not able to uh, tune in tonight or register for this, uh, we will be placing this after we review it on YouTube. 
um, in the coming days. So it will be available in that way. And so will the, um, the other uh, virtual lectures as well. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Captain Miles, for your time this evening and answering questions. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for running the slideshow and, and all the background. Um, and everyone take care and please tune in next week. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. -bye,